some of the most fascinating Some of the most fascinating battles in the Revolutionary War took place in the swamps and marshlands that bordered Spanish and British-occupied Florida and the revolting colony of Georgia. And in 1751, the British built a fort on the fork between the Altamaha and the Barrington Rivers in the swamps not too far away from the coastal islands. They did this to secure their sovereignty and protect against raids by Spanish-aligned Indians. Well, by 1778, the British were no longer occupying it, so American Patriots set out to refortify the structure and take it over. They quickly named it Fort Howe after the officer in charge of Patriots in the state of Georgia. But on March 13, 1778, Colonel Thomas Burntfoot Brown took it over, capturing and doing with the 23 American prisoners we don't know, because these 23 men, as far as I'm aware, were never really heard from again. So the events at the Fort Barrington, or rather Fort Howe, are to this day pretty secret. But Colonel Brown himself was in an odd position where he was a colonel, but he was also a leader of a band of Tory refugees, people who weren't necessarily under the true flag of Britain. It was a very shaky situation, and he led a lot of outlaws in East Florida. Of course, the Patriots took the fort back later that year, and eventually the British, of course, would leave America entirely. But very fascinating, fascinating battle, and it's totally unknown what really happened here. British-controlled East Florida was probably one of the most Wild West places in the American Revolutionary War. And the reason for this is that Patriot troops never really penetrated their defenses, and so throughout the course of the war, it became the safe haven for a number of loyalist terrorists, people like Thomas Burntfoot Brown. And eventually, by late 1778, the British government, at their wit's end, with the inability to gain a firm grip on their revolting colonies, decided to send Lieutenant Colonel James Mark Prevost up from the Altamaha River from Florida and into Georgia, where they would question everybody. And if you said that you didn't support king and country, your house would be burnt to the ground and you would be taken prisoner at best or slaughtered where you stood at worst. And this is a battlefield where we're standing now where men about 10 minutes south of the town of Medway actually decided to fight a delaying action. Of course the British made it into town and burnt the church down after burning down all the homes of people who supported the Patriot cause but it delayed them just long enough to get many of the men who were part of the militia out into the swamps where they could fight in the back country. Now, to gain a little bit of context for the skirmish at Bulltown Swamp, you have to understand that the forces under Lieutenant Colonel Prevost were British regulars, about a hundred of them. But alongside them were their Indian allies and about 300 refugees, people like Burntfoot Brown, people who had either gone to East Florida for protection and still demanded that they go back and get a little bit of satisfaction on the revolting colonists, or people who had actually committed crimes and decided to just put on the red coat where their crimes would be forgiven once they joined the regular British army. Now, these men were considered refugees, but they still took part in the skirmish here. Behind me is a monument to General James Screven, a local man who participated in the Battle of Alligator Bridge, one of the very few engagements in Florida during the Revolutionary Wars. And it's a fascinating story because there was a local loyalist by the name of Thomas Brown. They called the man Burntfoot because as Augusta began organizing with anti-British sentiment, he organized his own plantations and led groups of loyalists out in the woods and the wilderness to harass and terrorize local people in town. He was later captured and tortured where they burnt his feet nearly to the bone and he escaped and made his way to East Florida where he started leading a company of men called the King's Rangers. Now this was again British East Florida and because of this he was constantly harassing them from the south and operating in the back country of Georgia. He was a constant menace to patriots in the local area and so Screven thinks that it would be a good idea to lead 200 men to invade East Florida and take it for the Patriot cause. What he doesn't realize is that Burntfoot has a camp of over 700 and they encounter them at Alligator Bridge. Well, as they're approaching, 
Screven doesn't realize that he is being flanked by Burntfoot's men, but because Burntfoot recruits some men who are not too good company, they try to defect, and nobody here is wearing uniforms, so Burntfoot's men begin calling out, I wish to defect, I want to join the Patriot cause, and the Patriots whip around and apparently they shoot them. And an engagement follows at which there is a running fight with some of the Loyalist men trying to join forces with Screven, Screven shooting back at them, and both of them forcing their way to the Alligator Bridge itself. And when they're all on the bridge, they realize nobody's in uniform, so there's a moment of everyone just pointing guns at each other, and eventually Screven calls a retreat back over and into Georgia, realizing that this fight in Florida is futile and that 200 men won't be able to take East Florida from the British. And I think it's a fascinating engagement because it's one of the very few that took place in Florida. And when I said that the town of Midway was at one point the heart of revolutionary spirit in the state, I meant it because buried here in this cemetery in unmarked graves are many men who fought in the Revolutionary War. These are actually unmarked graves. And uh, I think it's really fascinating because the Sons of the American Revolution recently set up monuments to them. And this is what their original church would have looked like. It's fascinating to think about the meetings that would have taken place here, talking about probably the politics of the day. And one of those fascinating governors of early Georgia colonial history here would have been Nathan Brownson, who was elected as governor of the state after the fall of Augusta in January 1781. As such, he was more or less a provisional governor, and although he only served four and a half months, his term is generally viewed positively because he confiscated Tory land and sold it so that he could pay the militia, and he also served for a while in the Continental Congress. At one point in time, the small town of Medway, Georgia, was both the industrial heart of the state as well as the core revolutionary nucleus for the Deep South and the Revolutionary War. And as the story goes, it was founded in the early 1750s by Puritans and Calvinists of English and Scottish stock that came to the New World in the 1600s. So by the time the Revolutionary War actually kicked off, a lot of people in the state of Georgia viewed the king as someone who could protect them from a volatile situation on the ground. Indian raids, the Spanish to the south, and all of that. But this community had already realized it was possible to be self-sufficient, even in the hostile environment surrounded on all sides by swamps. So four of Georgia's revolutionary governors, who only served very short terms, as well as Lyman Hall and Button Gwinnett, two of the three signers of the Declaration of Independence from Georgia, all came from this small community. And during the Revolutionary War, the British, moving their way down they managed to use the church behind me as a headquarters, but after they left, they burned it. And after this moment in time, the port of Medway was basically destroyed. So this port, which was the most efficient port and the deepest port east of the Mississippi at that time, was totally overpassed and that port went to Savannah. And the town of Medway over the years basically evaporated and eventually became a ghost town. And behind me, in the cemetery behind the church are some pretty interesting monuments from the Revolutionary War. And even though the church was burned down by British forces, it was rebuilt in 1792 and remained an important symbol of independence for this small southern town. That is, until Union forces came through in 1864, but miraculously the church was spared. Daniel Stewart, who is commemorated on the Screven Monument, was a 15-year-old boy when the revolution began. He actually made his way up to South Carolina because his father was fighting in the war, but they wouldn't have him in the local area because they knew he was just a boy. And he joined the war there, and he was taken prisoner, and as a storm blew through, he was on a prison ship. And the British men left the prison ship, and everybody who was on board was left to their own devices. And the men who could swim did and he left to fight in the war, but he really gained fame during the Indian Wars many years later. And here in the cemetery also is the grave of John Jones, who was an infant child 
when his father was killed in the Siege of Savannah, another Revolutionary War activist who was on the side of the Patriots. And uh, also, buried right next to them, you have many Revolutionary War graves here. You have Colonel William Maxwell, who was a captain in the Liberty Independent Troop, which was a local militia outfit that was involved with a lot of the Revolutionary War. Now, because this was a incredibly important area for the Patriots in the Revolutionary War, the British troops, when they marched into town, went from door to door asking who supported the king. And all the men who said that they didn't had their houses burned. Of course, Button Gwinnett was very high on that list, as well as Lyman Hall.